Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for free premium sports picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. I'm just going to ramble here a little bit this morning, try to respond to some of the emails I've received, and just give you my thoughts on a few things. First, let's talk for a brief minute about cryptocurrencies. Many people have asked me because the price has been volatile, whether I still believe in dark coin. My response is absolutely. Understand cryptocurrencies are the future, not because they're a fad, but because they are technologically superior to fiat paper currency. What I want you to do is to look at who's winning things like the Bitcoin Silk Road auction. It's heavyweights like Tim Draper, right? We're talking about big names in tech coming in and investing millions of dollars in the technology because they see it. Now look at the American dollar. Look at the crazy deficits we're running. Look at the inflation around you. Look at beef prices jumping up, gas prices jumping up, the things you use jumping up in price. Understand that if they measured inflation by the methodology that they used in the 1980s, inflation would be close to double digits, if not in the double digits. Right? So, number one, you can't believe government numbers on inflation. Number two, you need a hedge against the U.S. dollar. I imagine as I make this video, there are many people looking at their local currency, realizing they need a hedge against the local currency. Now, why dark coin? By the way, I'm also in Bitcoin. I'm also in Monero. But why dark coin in particular? It's because it is the most widely used right private cryptocurrency and I believe there are a host of people out there count me among them who value their privacy right so this is the top half of the first inning for dark coin yes I firmly believe in dark coin I think right now the prize is just the tip of the iceberg also track my dark coin advice here online just google Dwyer dark coin since I recommended dark coin, dark coin is up something like five or six fold. You've already hit a home run on it. My point to you though is it's still the top of the first. There's still a lot of room to run. And as I said earlier this year, to me the best play you can make this year is Bitcoin, right? By Bitcoin I really mean the elite cryptocurrencies. Right, but Bitcoin, Dark Coin, Monero, by the way, Monero has doubled since I recommended it. Um, I don't see any sports bet as valuable as these cryptocurrencies. I hope you give them a look. Now let's talk about a few other things. Box Rec this morning has Adonis Stevenson rated as the top light heavyweight in the world. I'm just here to tell you I wouldn't even blink. I wouldn't even have to think about it. If they announce a fight between Bernard Hopkins and Adana Stevenson. I take Hopkins in a second. I believe you saw the real Adana Stevenson in the later rounds against Andres Fonfaro. Right? Stevenson is really just a great left hand. He's just a great left hand. If you can push him to the middle rounds and take a look at his recent fights. What you're going to find out is many of them ended early. If you could push him to the middle rounds and if you're savvy enough to just block that left, Stevenson would be in trouble. Dare I say if you could dance around the ring with Stevenson and smother him, Stevenson would be in trouble. Let me just say, just like I'd have no hesitation taking Bernard Hopkins over Stevenson, and it looks, given the rankings on box rack, like Hopkins would be a considerable underdog in that fight. I would also take super middleweight champions, well, champion Andre Ward in a heartbeat over Donna Stevenson. I believe Ward's the kind of guy who would feast on a one-handed fighter. Let me say, too, Andre Ward's right hand has been surgically repaired. 
right? Ward feels that he's doing things with the right hand that he hasn't done in years. I'd take Andre Ward over Stevenson. I'd also take James DeGale. Now, I know I've been pubbing DeGale here online a long time. Yes, I'm going to definitely take DeGale over Frotch if Frotch ever decides to fight him. But understand, DeGale is a unique talent who you simply cannot beat if you're just one-handed. Let me say this. George Groves is two-handed. I know George Groves has come under a lot of criticism here online, but let's at least acknowledge that George Groves is two-handed. <clears throat> I know Groves beat the Gale, at least on the judges' scorecards. I'd certainly take the Gale over Donna Stevenson. Right? I understand that I'm a contrarian on the play. Won't be the first time. Now let's talk about an analogy that kind of leapt out at me as I was watching Major League Baseball's All-Star Game. Let me just say this. The starter for the American League was Felix Hernandez. I believe there are a lot of analogies between baseball and other sports, especially boxing. But let me just, just indulge me for a moment here. Now Felix Hernandez takes the mound. He's a surefire Hall of Famer. He's long been the dominant pitcher in baseball. But Hernandez has a certain swagger. He has a certain confidence and he connects with teammates. Right? Harold Reynolds doing the telecast said he asked Hernandez what his best pitch was. And Hernandez said all five. Right? That's the mindset. Well, let me say this. Felix Hernandez's nickname is the King. And as I watched him, I thought to myself, that's right. That's who this guy is. This guy is Jordan. He's not Pippin. Right? He's not, you know, a guy trying to establish his leadership. Now, this is a guy who shows up and you immediately know he is the leader. He's the workhorse. Let's hop on his back. You know the guys I'm talking about. Guys like Peyton Manning. Right? Guys who you understand when they take the floor, they are the top dog. Now, I've said this for a while now. Felix Hernandez is the king. Right? Not LeBron James. I think LeBron James is a major talent. There is no doubt about it. He's a major talent. But he's not the king. There's some piece of the puzzle that's not there. In other words, you know, Michael Jordan didn't really care what the press thought. Understand, Jordan, as dominant as he was, went through a period of time where he boycotted the press. Really didn't care what the press thought. He had a job to do. He wasn't trying to make you happy. He was trying to win basketball games along the road. You followed him in doing so because he was dazzling. LeBron James, to me, is a different personality type. So as I look at before the heat, right, who people who follow Dwyer Sports betting know I was betting against in the NBA Finals, right? As I look at the heat and as I now look at the Cavaliers, right, understand that in my opinion, as great as LeBron is, the team's going to have to buy into what he's bringing to the table. The leadership's not going to be natural. Colin Cowherd put it best. He was comparing and contrasting LeBron to someone like Kobe Bryant. Now, Kobe has a lot of problems. I personally think Kobe's a narcissist, right? I believe Jordan would have been thanking the lucky stars if he ever got the opportunity to play with a center as dominant as Shaquille O'Neal, right? Kobe had problems with Shaquille, right? I think Jordan would feel his team was overloaded if he ever got the opportunity to play with Paul Gasol and Andrew Bynum. Kobe had a problem with Gasol and Bynum. In fact, Kobe took most of the shots when they played. But as Cowherd has said on his show, and I agree with him 100%, 
right? The way the Miami Heat situation would have worked out if LeBron were Kobe Bryant is Kobe would have been in a room with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh, and he would have said to them, look, man, guys, I want the max. I want 22. You take 10 and you take 12, right? I mean, that's the way these guys are. LeBron's not that way. He wants to please a lot of people. There is a chance it's remote looking at the personality type, looking at his game against Stanford, right? But there is a chance that Wiggins is a Jordan figure, right? If Wiggins is, the team will be his by December, Right? If he defers to LeBron and is one of these guys who wants to stand in line and worship others, then the team will be LeBron's. But make no mistake, if LeBron were on a team with Kobe, it'd be Kobe's team. If LeBron were on a team with Michael Jordan, it'd be Michael Jordan's team. Right? If LeBron were on a team with Felix Hernandez, Felix Hernandez would be the man we call king. Let's shift gears. Let me say this. As I watched the All-Star game, I noticed there are two different groups of pitchers, right? Baseball fans have known this for years. They're starters. Guys like Felix Hernandez. What's his best pitch? All five. And then they're relievers. I was looking at Chapman of the Reds. He throws a fastball over 100 miles an hour. He doesn't have enough other pitches to be a starter. Right, you look at these relievers, they look great. Craig Kimbrell, right? They have a couple of pitches. Right? It's the bigs. You need more than one. But you understand that all they have is a couple of pitches. Right? They're not guys who can fool you for seven innings. They're guys who can fool you for two innings. Right? Same thing in boxing. The difference, though, is in boxing, there isn't a group that's allowed to just come in and fight two or three rounds, right? Everyone, if you want to be a champion, is expected to be able to participate in 12-round events. What I want you to do is to consider Deontay Wilder. I understand he's unbeaten. Okay, okay, we'll be the voice in the wilderness here. I know he's put on a show. But right now in his career, Deontay Wilder is just a relief pitcher. He's not a starter. Right? He has a great fastball. Right? That fastball is his long right hand. You know the punch I'm talking about. It's the punch that drops all these guys. Right? It's the punch that, you know, literally has made his career. Malik Scott. You know, come on down. Audley Harrison, come on down. These guys are certainly falling down when they fight Deontay Wilder. Right? But understand what happens to relievers in baseball if they end up going past the third and fourth innings. They fall apart. Pretty soon, batters start to figure out how to time that fastball. If all you have is that 100 mile an hour fastball, then I'm going to sit on it. I might even just guess. Let's say you have a fastball and a changeup. I might guess. I might say, okay, well, I've timed this fastball. I'm just going to guess that he's throwing a fastball. If all you have is two pitches, well, I have a 50% chance of getting a fastball. If I'm a fastball hitter or I've timed that fastball, I could do damage. That's Deontay Wilder. Let me shake things up. Right? Because Wilder only has a fastball, if Wilder ever enters the ring against a KG vet, let's say, and I know every time I mention this guy's name I discredit myself, but let's say Bernard Hopkins. Keep in mind, by the way, I know people are amazed at the weight difference between a light heavyweight and a heavyweight, right? But... Deontay Wilder really doesn't work you over inside. He doesn't lean on you inside. He doesn't throw his weight around inside. He's not big George Foreman, right? He's not, these days, Vladimir Klitschko in terms of leaning on you. He's not Tyson Fury 
take a look at the Steve Cunningham fight where Fury's leaning all over Steve Cunningham. That's not Deontay Wilder's game. In fact, isn't that part of the problem with Deontay Wilder? Does he have that part of the game? So you can imagine a guy like Hopkins who likes to give away the first round as it is, who starts slow. Can you imagine Hopkins in there just guarding against a left hand for the first few rounds? Excuse me, a right hand, long right hand for the first few rounds. Getting the fight to the fourth round and then realizing that he's in against a guy who's never been to the fifth round in his entire career. Who can't fight on the inside like Bernard Hopkins. He can't. Right? Who you could defense because since his Sunday punch is a long right hand. You could defense Wilder if you know what you're doing by just being inside of the long right hand. Right? If you're mid-range, maybe Wilder will shorten it and try to throw a right hook. But his right hook's not the same as his long right hand. It's not. And so could you imagine Hopkins against Wilder knowing that all he has to do is allow Wilder to hit him with left hands? Meanwhile, Bernard would be the one inside tying up Deontay Wilder. Hopkins would know, and Hopkins likes to duck his head and run in. He would know Wilder can't fight at all backing up. Now, this isn't obvious to a lot of people because knockouts cause amnesia. We see Malik Scott go down and we say, wow, what was that, one round? What was that, less than three minutes? What? You know, the bottom line, though, is all Wilder has done is shown us what Chapman of the Reds has shown us in baseball, that he has a great fastball. He hasn't shown us anything else. Now, contrast that with Bermain Stavert, who might be Wilder's next opponent. Understand that Stavert once came out and knocked down a man, Demetrius King. King got up a few rounds later, dazed Stavert. Right, Stavern's head was a little bit cloudy. Then the referee stepped in and stopped the fight. Stavern was officially knocked out in the fight. Then Stavern later in his career is fighting Ray Austin. He's in trouble in the fight. He's about to lose the fight on the scorecards. It's the tenth round. He stops Ray Austin in the tenth round. You saw that first fight against Ariola. You saw the second fight against Chris Ariola. Understand, Remain Stavern has been 12 with a tough opponent like Chris Ariola. Stavern has had to come back from adversity. Right? He's technically been knocked out in a fight. Right? I take Stavern over Deontay Wilder. Stavern has done more. He's been through more. He actually has boxing skills. Watch Stavern against Ariola. There are parts of that fight where Stavern's backing up, setting traps, has his back up against the ropes. You haven't seen that in a Deontay Wilder fight. Well, you have seen the opponent with his back up against the ropes, but not Wilder. Right? Stavern actually has boxing skills. Let me let you in on a secret. If Wilder fights Stavern, Wilder's only going to be one of two punchers in the ring. Remain Stavern is one of the hardest punchers in the sport of boxing. Now, I'll agree, Stavern has shortcomings. He doesn't have the hand speed of a David Hay. Fair enough. Speaking of Mr. Hay, Stavern also can't throw the punch from halfway across the ring like David Hay. Stavern has to play chess with you a bit, get you to open up, then he unloads his big hooks. Fair enough, right? That would leave him vulnerable against starting pitcher types like, let's say, you know, a Antonio Tarver, guys with game who are playing angles. 
But against Wilder, and I don't care how many fights Wilder's had, Wilder's a newbie. Against a newbie like Wilder who hasn't even made it to the fifth round. Right? <laughs> I mean, who hasn't even been knocked down in a fight. Who hasn't had to come back in a fight. Who hasn't had to hold on in a fight. Against a guy who hasn't had those experiences. In other words, against a guy who's inexperienced. I don't believe Stavern is going to have those problems. So I like Bermain Stavern against Deontay Wilder. I'll say this. I consider Wilder to be a guy who is overrated by the boxing public. Now obviously Wilder could shut me up. Wilder could go on a tear, could beat Stavern, could beat Vladimir Klitschko, could unify the heavyweight title, could learn the game as he's in his career, and can be one of the dominant heavyweight champions in history. He certainly has a dominant record right now. Look at that KO percentage. That's possible. I would argue that it's unlikely. Right? Put another way. Think about Vladimir Klitschko. One of the secrets to Vladimir Klitschko's success, and it's a big secret, is the fact that Vladimir Klitschko lost fights to people like Ross Purity, Lehman Brewster. He's knocked down multiple times by Sam Peter. That's his past, right? He's had trouble against southpaws like Tony Thompson, the first fight, right? He's faced different guys. He's gone into the later rounds, right? He's gone 12 rounds. When you look at Vladimir Klitschko today, he's experienced, right? He knows what it's like to get knocked out in a fight. He knows what happens when he doesn't pace himself. Look at the first Lehman Brewster fight. He's been around. So if he's in the ring with an opponent and things are going south or he's dazed, you know what? He's been there. He can make the adjustment. That's one of the reasons why he is the heavyweight champion. Right? Now contrast that with Deontay Wilder. I'm just here to tell you. Most fighters, when they start their career, if they have a lot of talent, and Wilder's right hand is accurate and it's heavy, right? And he can throw it from halfway across the ring, right? Wilder has talent. But when you start out and you have talent, often you'll start your career with a string of great-looking knockouts. It's not until somebody solves the puzzle that you then have to make the adjustments and show what you're made of. Now just understand, if you're a Wilder person, if you're a person who believes Wilder's all that and has shown it, let me just say you've never seen Wilder in the fifth round of a fight. How many fights have you watched in which guys look dominant the first half of the fight and then they're barely hanging on the second half of the fight? Fighters hit walls. They need second wins. Romain Stavern has been there. Chris Ariola is an active fighter. His first fight against Ariola goes 12. His fight against Ray Austin, a guy who fought Vladimir Klitschko. Right? A guy who gave, you know, uh, quite a few people. Adlanir Solis, a hard match. Made it to the 10th round. Right? Stavern is more battle-tested. Look at Stavern against Ariola. Ariola crowds it. Stavern is backed up against the ropes. There's no panic. Even against an offensive juggernaut like Chris Ariola. There's no panic. He's countering Ariola off the ropes. Just ask yourself, has Deontay Wilder been in that position? Just ask yourself, right? What happens when a reliever is asked to pitch the fourth, fifth, 
6th and 7th innings. Right? Is Deontay Wilder Max Scherzer, a reliever who is now a great starting pitcher, right? Last year's American League Cy Young winner. Or is he the kind of guy who falls apart after people start to time his fastball? Aren't you concerned about Deontay Wilder's underdeveloped left hand? Let me just say, too, a guy can believe he's invincible. There's no more, uh, there's no more revealing moment in life than when you realize that you're mortal. What happens if Wilder gets buzzed and hurt in the middle rounds? It's already happened and it's already cost remains to burn. He's been there. He has experience in that area. That Demetrius King fight, I believe, officially is a fourth-round knockout of Stever. Right? Wilder, this would be his first time in that neighborhood. If you're fighting Bermain Stever, you need to expect to be buzzed, you know, at least every other round. The guy hits hard. So I would take Bermain Stever in that fight. I would expect him to win the fight. Understand, you can have your cake and eat it too. You don't have to take both guys by KO. What you could do is take Stavern to win the fight. You should be able to get pretty good odds. Right? Pretty good odds on Stavern to win the fight. And if you want to double your pleasure, then you could simply take the under. If Stavern closes the show early, Right? Then you win both halves of the bet. If Wilder closes the show, and in my opinion it'd have to be early, then you would win on the hedge. But make no mistake, just as a fan, I would expect Bermain Stavern to win that fight. In fact, I would question whether Wilder has the capability to go the distance, to go a full 12 with Bermain Stavern. Right? You don't take the training wheels off in a heavyweight title fight. If you've never gone fifth, if you've never made it to the fifth round against non championship level competition, how do you expect to be competitive in the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth rounds against one of the reigning heavyweight champions? I'd expect Remains to Vern to beat Deontay Wilde. Deontay Wilder. I'm getting too excited here. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.